to try to read it. And the reason I say this, the re one of the reasons I go at it from this direction is that we have a very difficult time, I think, realizing just how radical, just how, how, how totally transforming, how, 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 how not even just radical, but miraculous this change in Saul to Paul was. And when we grasp this, I know that we, I know that we, 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 we study Jesus, we study the Gospels because, because Jesus was the revelation and is the revelation of God. But when we look at Paul, Paul was, Paul was a very, very unique person because he was caught in the middle. He was an apostle, but he literally did not walk with Jesus while Jesus was walking the earth but yet he was radically confronted by Jesus. And he's an apostle. But where was he coming from? Do you know, Paul was raised in, in Tarsus, which is in modern-day Turkey. It's, it's up around the Mediterranean there and, and from Israel. And Paul was raised in a very, you could tell, he was raised in a very devout Jewish home. They were Pharisees. Fer and, and, and Pharisees and religion is so different than what we think of. Religion for us is a philosophical position and, and set of beliefs that people have that they integrate from one degree to another into their lives. But religion for the Jew and for the people in that era was everything. It was their, it was their, their, it was their family structure. It was their political structure. It was their work structure. You couldn't do business in a town if you did not cooperate with, with the particular deities in that city. You could not do business. You couldn't get a job. You had to be in this enclave. You had to be in this, in this, in this community, this tight community, and, and, and the Jews were unique. The Jewish people were unique in the Roman world because in the Roman world, if you did not honor the local deities and then Caesar, this deity, you, were, you, 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 didn't, you, you couldn't operate, you were criminal. But for some reason, the Jewish people, they held so tightly, no matter where they were dispersed, they held so tightly that they would not honor these other gods, that they would not bow to Caesar. But what they did was they did some smart things. So what they said was, like to the Roman government, they said, okay, so we're not going to bow to this Roman empire here, but what we'll do is we'll pray for you. <laughs> we'll pray that God blesses Caesar, and so the Romans, being who they were, while they were brutal, they were also practical. And they said, okay, we can live with that. Now, there was no privacy, generally, in these communities. We've, we've been in these communities where the, the, the homes are open and they're tight. You live in this community, unless you had wealth, extreme wealth, you had no privacy in your home. You had no privacy in your lives. Everybody knew everything that was going on in your life. This makes it, so historically, this isn't just, this is an opinion. This is just ancient history. The way that these cities were structured, you had these Jewish communities, you had your, 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 your the rest of the world, the pagans, the, 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 the philosophers, whoever they were, you had them within your cities, right? So Paul was raised in Tarsus, not around Jerusalem. And he probably moved to Jerusalem sometime in his, in his teen years because he was 
taught them by G Gamaliel, okay? But Paul knew his stuff going into Jerusalem. He was raised on the scripture. He wore the phylacteries. He wore the, 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 the regalia, the, the, the Bible verses hanging from him. He, he, he knew this stuff backwards and forwards, and his education... You, when you raise children, you know that even though they may go off in a different way, in the core of them, where they were raised affects and impacts them, right? It's, who, it's, it's, it's what they know. And this is what Paul knew. And he studied under Gamaliel, but, but Gamaliel, he was, he was of a different philosophy than Paul. Gamaliel was a was a, a, a teacher of the Torah, yes, but his was live and let live. If you, didn't, if you didn't want to adhere to it, you didn't adhere to it. Paul, on the other hand, was a zealot. He was a radical. He was watching out for this community and saying, if I don't defend this community, then bad things are going to happen. See, where he was raised was he was raised with the stories, right? We all know the stories. We know the stories of Adam and Eve. We know the stories uh, of, of, of Daniel. And, 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 and Adam and Eve were in the garden, and they were meant to subdue and grow this paradise, right? But they didn't adhere to the agreement with God, and they were taken out of the garden. I could say kicked out, but God lovingly removed them, right? So he was raised with these stories of redemption, of, 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 of actual forgiveness, and this is what the, the core of the Jewish people were raised with. They were raised with these stories of God in some way, coming to them and meeting them on earth. This was how the temple was structured. The temple was structured, the old wilderness temple and Solomon's temple and Herod's temple, they all had these places of the cosmos, heavens meeting earth. And this is where the people thought that they could, that they could experience God, because God would dwell there where heaven met earth the very structure of the temple was meant, the structure of the temple was meant to be able to reflect this reality. And going to the temple in Jerusalem was where they thought they might be able to experience this presence of God. Now, if you live, though, out in, in the Asia, in Asia Minor or 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 you were dispersed, the way that you experienced this or tried to experience this meeting of God was you, you, you kept the law, you kept the Torah, you followed the prayer rituals, you, 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 it, and you were seeking this presence that the people experienced, they said, in the temple. After the dispersion, after the, sec after the first temple was, was destroyed and, and, and they were dispersed around the world, they kept the law, they kept the Torah, they kept the, so that, but, but remember, this was so that, that they could see God reaching down and touching them and meeting us on earth. And Isaiah and the prophets, in, in prophesying the Messiah, this was, this was the hope then that within their persecuted times that God would reach them with this chosen one to free them up, just like they were freed up when they, when they were, went from the wilderness into the promised land, just, just, like, just like they were, they, they, they were freed up when they were able to build the temple to rebuild the temple, though they were looking for the Savior. They read Daniel, and Daniel's 490, the weeks, they knew what was coming. Paul was very, very 
versed on all of this. He was devout. He wanted to see the presence of God in his people, in Israel. He thought that if he did not defend this, that they were going to be punished. He thought that they were going to lose it again. You got to see, Paul was, Paul was, his heart was one that was so integrated into this story, looking for this ultimate forgiveness. Because remember, if you keep the law, you do your prayers, somehow God's presence might be there. You were just hoping. They had ecstatic experiences. They, you, know, you look at Ezekiel and, and the wheels and, 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 and this revelation, who's the person in this story? They were wanting to know this. So I just wanted to give you just a little bit of background because sometimes we're very quick at this story. So let's read, let's read um, just this first part of Acts 9, okay, from the Passion. I'm loving the Passion Bible. It's a translation that's done both from the Greek and the Aramaic. It's a direct translation, okay? Um, so during those days, Saul, full of angry threats and rage, Remember, he's a zealot. He's going to defend his... He's not just defending some religion. He is defending his family. He's defending his nation. He's defending from, 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 from this corruption. But remember, too, idolatry was something that was, they were very sensitive to. They were very sensitive to idolatry and pulling anything else from outsiders. So this is what he was doing. He was full of angry threats and rage, wanted to murder the disciples of the Lord Jesus. So he went to ask the high priest and requested a letter of authorization he could take to the Jewish leaders in Damascus. So Damascus is north from Jerusalem, north of, north of uh, the Sea of Galilee. So requesting cooperation in finding and arresting any who were followers of the way. That is what they were calling the Jewish people who were following Jesus. They were calling it the way. Saul wanted to capture all the believers he found, both men and women, and drag them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. So he obtained the authorization and left for Damascus. Just outside the city, a brilliant light flashed from heaven suddenly and exploded all around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a booming voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The men accompanying Saul, remember, he, he, he doesn't go alone. He has his disciples. He has people that are following him. He, he has other people that are helping him in this effort. The men accompanying Saul were stunned and speechless, for they heard a heavenly voice but could see no one. Saul replied, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus the victorious, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go to the city where you will be told what you are to do. Saul stood to his feet, and even though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. He was blind. So the men had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. For three days he didn't eat or drink and couldn't see a thing. Remember, Paul was devout, and he would on a daily basis be going into prayer, wanting to experience, wanting to know the presence of God. He may not say the name God out loud, but that's who he's praying to. And he's wanting to have an experience. He's wanting to know the direction that God has for him. Living in Damascus was a believer named Ananias. 
the Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling his name Ananias. Yes, Lord, Ananias answered. The Lord said, go at once to the street called Abundance and look for a man from Tarsus named Saul. You will find him at Judah's house. While he was praying, he saw in a supernatural vision a man named Ananias coming to lay hands upon him to restore his sight. But Lord Ananias replied, many have told me about his, this, his terrible persecution of those in Jerusalem who are devoted to you. In fact, the high priest has authorized him to seize and imprison all of those in Damascus who call on your name. The Lord Yahweh answered him, arise and go. I have chosen this man to be my special messenger. He will be brought before kings, before many nations, and before the Jewish people to give them the revelation of who I am. And I will show him how much he is destined to suffer because of his passion for me. His passion. Yeah. God understood that, that Saul, Paul, did have passion for him, right? And he was earnestly seeking him. Remember how Paul describes himself. No one kept the law any more perfectly than he did. Nobody was as devoted. He, he, he was incredibly devoted. Historians say about Paul, they, they say that Paul was incredibly intelligent, that he could, that he could outthink the best of philosophers. He was raised around this. I've been reading a book um, by N.T. Wright called uh, Paul, a Biography. And, and Wright is an excellent theologian and historian from England. And some of the things he points out about Saul and the way that he was raised was we say he was a tent maker, right? Well, in Tarsus, there's, there was a big industry with, 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 with cashmere, with goats, with, 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 with these fibers, and they would make living quarters. We saw the Bedouins roaming you know, out, in, out in the desert when we were there. They, they have these tents, and, and, and they, 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 they move from place to place. And Tarsus was in a trading route. So Saul, growing up and learning this trade, he interacted with people from all over the world. He interacted with people with, with probably people who would come to the business and, and even, even intellectuals who would come there. And, and he probably heard the debates. He may have not read some of, the, some of the outside literature about their gods and all, but he heard it. He was very intelligent. He, he, he was very exposed to the outside world while being totally Jewish. So he was in a unique position, Paul was, an, an incredible mind. An incredible mind. Um, so when he said he was a tent maker, I mean, I mean, that's that's like that's like a contractor. That's like someone who could build your homes. That's like somebody who knew so much about how people lived on a daily basis. He was very real about who he who he knew people to be, and he interacted with people across the economic spectrum. So when he got knocked down, I mean, this is what he sought. <laughs> in, in some ways, he's surprised by the extent of it, probably, and by what, by, what he, by what he's told by Jesus. But yet, this is the experience, these are the experiences that he wanted. He wanted to hear from God. He was desiring to hear from God. And he did. So what I want to explore, like next week and maybe the following, is, is this transformation that, 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 that Saul went through. And I think it's important. I think it's important on a couple of levels for us. Number one, we read the New Testament all the time, and, and the majority is written by Paul. Okay. Um, but what, but, the, but where Paul came from and his thinking on what this was that he was doing might be a, 
might just be just a shade different than what you've believed in your own life. And if that is, I want to know that, right? I want to know what happened to change this person historically. We can't get into Paul's head. We, don't, we can't do a psychoanalytic analysis of him. But we can tell historically what was the position he was in, what was going on in that world. We can know that part, at least in general. You know, for Paul, the term salvation did not mean to go into the heavenlies, primarily. For Paul, the salvation that he was looking for was God reaching to the earth, God reaching them in their circumstances. The word hope, when, they, when we talk about hope, Hope was not a feeling that they got. Hope was based in faith on seeing beyond their circumstances because they had really lousy circumstances. A lot of them did, the world that they lived in there. Hope was something that they, that they, that they knew and that they practiced every day. They would talk about it. They would talk about the hope that they had. And culminating with Daniel's prophecy, they were looking for something pretty soon. They were looking for something then. So I think, I think we can gain a little bit more insight in, into, into what this movement was that was starting here. Why is it that we had a guy like Paul go around to smaller areas, not even totally the major cities, but because he never went into Africa. But why is it that Paul established these little communities, not dissimilar to AMP right here, okay? This is a little community of people. Why is it that he established these little communities of people outside of the synagogue? Because Paul saw what he was doing as not a conversion. We talk about the conversion of Paul. He didn't see it as a conversion of, his, of, of who he was. He saw this as a completion. He saw this as completing this promise, not in the way that he thought or the way that the people thought, but he saw this as a completion. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. Right? We don't want to worship the old law because that's a shadow of what was to come. We worship, we worship because of Jesus. We worship Christ. We worship God, the Father, because of Christ. He completed all of this work. So, so, so much of the questions that have been asked over the centuries, they weren't even questions that Paul asked. While Paul later in his life said, oh yeah, I want to go be with the Lord. I would rather be with the Lord because he's reaching the end. But that wasn't his primary deal. His primary deal, remember what he said? He said, I would rather that I be put away. I, I would rather be put away for my people, if my people, if Israel came to know Jesus, I would, I, I would give myself up. That was his driving force. That was what he wanted. So we go to, we go to Romans chapter 8, and Romans is his great book. Romans is his great, great from beginning to end book. And in the middle of Romans, there's a transition at the beginning of the chapter that, ta that talks about the fact that there's no condemnation for us now who are in Christ. So we, so we go many years later into Paul's letter, and we read this. We read, so what does all this mean? Having talked about how we are in Christ, and we'll look at that. But he's arriving at this conclusion in chapter 8. 
He's saying, so what does all this mean? If God has determined to stand with us, tell me, who then could ever stand against us? For God has proved his love. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever think about do you ever think about your relationships? Do you ever think about your, 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 your relationships with your spouse or your family or your friends? And, and sometimes you say, remember maybe when you were younger or maybe last week you said, you really don't love me. If you love me, dot, 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 dot. Right? We tend to gauge love based upon the latest experience and behavior that we have. We tend to do that on some levels. Right? But just remember, God showed us, God has determined to stand with us, for God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his son. That, that says it. I mean, that's, that's total. God doesn't even need to say anything else. He gave us Christ, and Christ redeemed us. And since God freely offered him up as the sacrifice for us all, he certainly won't withhold from us anything else he has to give. Who then would dare to accuse those whom God has chosen in love to be his? God himself is the judge who has issued his final verdict over them, not guilty. Who then is left to condemn us? Certainly not Jesus, the anointed one, for he gave us his life for us. And even more than that, he has conquered death and is now risen, exalted, and enthroned by God at his right hand. So how could he possibly condemn us since he is continuing, continually praying for our triumph? Who could ever separate us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love toward us. Nothing in the universe. Remember what Paul, Paul's background. Remember how extensively he could talk with any philosopher. He, he knows the extent of intellectual pursuit. He knows this extent. And he says nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love toward us. Troubles, pressures, and problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. What about persecutions? deprivations, dangers, and death threats? No, for they are all impotent to hinder an omnipotent love, even though it is written. Do you have the next one? Uh, uh, uh. Do you have the next slide? There we go. All day long we face death threats for your sake, God. We are considered to be nothing more than sheep to be slaughtered, Yet even in the midst of all these things, we triumph over them all. For God has made us to be more than conquerors. And his demonstrated, and his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I am convinced that his love will triumph over death life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished on us through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. Wow. 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 So in the next week or two, I, 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 want to, I want to look and see how is it that we have Paul taken from this, this zealot, this person persecuting the church, dragging people in, participating in stoning, participating in these things. How do you take somebody that is so right there and somebody that penned this somebody that wrote this how how do you 
how do you transform? How do you go from this person to this person? And I think this is a question for all of us to realize the transforming work of Christ in our lives. Okay? Okay. Let, let, let's stand up. Let's pray. Father, um, you left no stone unturned. You, you left no, no gap. You left no question. You took circumstances and people that we would have never chosen, and, and you, you saw their passion, and, 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 and you changed the course of their lives, and you changed the course of our lives. So, Father, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you for doing that. I thank you for creating us, in us, somebody that is created to love. Thank you for this day. I pray that the compassion that you've shown us, that you've shown me, that we can show to others today, in our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Look forward to seeing you guys again next week, okay? Thank you.